It was a fairly warm welcome, wasn't it, Kerry? <laughs> Let's see how we go from here. Good Lovely on. to be here tonight. Let me start, because a lot of people may not know you're a Queenslander through and through. Brisbane well, General Hospital. I've tried Hos my best to make it well known. <laughs> <laughs> Brisbane General Hospital, August 27, 1945. Parents Jack and Lotta. And you can't help but just love, particularly Lotta, through your book. What did they teach you? Well, they were, I, I think they were probably pretty. Um, representative uh, of a lot of Australians emerging from a combination of First World War depression and Second World War uh, into a rather black and white world where most people really just wanted to lead fairly peaceful lives uh, and try and settle down after all the mayhem that they'd lived through. But they were, um, I think partly it was reflected through their Catholicism, but they were uh, good-hearted people both of whom, I think, had a sense of humour, both of whom had inquiring minds. And, and I suspect one reason you would have particularly responded to Lotta is because she was, she was a, an avid reader. Um, and, and being of her time, although she had qualified to go to university I, and, and confided to my sister Barbara, who's here tonight, uh, years later, that she would have actually liked to be a chemist. But instead, she became a hairdresser and then when she married, um, became a housewife. And so she lived basically at home uh, in terms of any kind of profession. She, her profession was to be um, the mother and the wife and look after the home. But her reading was her escape and it became mine. So, uh, you know, it was nothing to walk into mum's room and Patrick White would be on the side of her bed or Dostoevsky. And I'm not singling them out as a, in a pretentious way. I, I'm, I'm signalling that she read with serious intent yeah. and her instincts were to look for quality literature. And it was a, a fairly happy and stable childhood. Stanthorpe, Warwick, Yoronga, Tennyson. Uh, TV had not been invented. Um, well, it had been invented, but it certainly hadn't oh, made well, its way to Australia. Oh, correct. <laughs> what well, wasn't in your lounge room. <laughs> um, I don't go back that far, Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> Billy Cart races, fights yeah. with your, your brother and your sister? Yeah, I didn't have, didn't have many fights with my older brother Tony because uh, he was seven years older than me and uh, by the time I was seven and he was 14 we all stood on Warwick Station waving him farewell as he uh, went off to Strathfield Christian Brothers Training College in Sydney to learn to be a Christian brother even though he was incredibly bright uh, could have virtually... <laughs> That was, an un that was an unconscious slip, <laughs> which perhaps make it, makes it even more potent. Um, no, I, I'm not here to denigrate the brothers. I could tell you a few stories, but I'm not here to denigrate the brothers because, because they were people who either had a vocation or felt they had a vocation. How on earth you can decide at 14 you've got a vocation, you're going to give up your life, the rest of your life, to God? But he didn't, did he? No, he didn't, as I said. <laughs> So, so, um, so he went off to America. Well, he, 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 for six years, uh, he was at Strathfield. He topped the leaving, which is now our year 12, uh, in English. I think he, he was very high up in at least three other subjects. So in other words, he really was um, a kind of, he became an intellectual, a real one. But, uh, but at the end of his, his, uh, his schooling, they sent him to a farm at Minto where he built stone paths for two years and learnt about poverty, chastity and obedience and uh, then they allowed him to go to university and uh, by the end of his first year at uni he'd married. <laughs> well so back to you then though. He, then he went to Harvard, Harvard. Yeah, then he had a scholarship to Harvard. So yeah. you raised the Catholicism because you yourself were an altar boy, you are educated at, uh, at Laurie's, Christian Barbara Brothers, remembers. a practising Catholic. Little, my red satan and my you know whatever else, <laughs> slippers, red slippers. And you, and you actually were, were practising Catholic probably to your early 30s. That's about right. Um, I mean, I mean the, the, it became more practice than reality uh, in, the par, in, the, in the last years. I was more going to Mass on Sundays for my children than I was through burning faith. Uh, and, uh, and I've never denigrated anybody else for their faith, but um, whatever, however you define faith, I lost it. Why? Well, I think, I think 
um, I'd been kind of slowly building to a point going all the way back to my teen years. Um, um, there were things there were there were things to like about about being a part of that kind of community, uh, but uh, but you, you you there was a certain point in your in your questions driven by a natural curiosity where you'd be stonewalled, whether it was the brothers or whether it was a priest, that there was a certain point where you ran out of explanation and it just had to be about faith. You know, well. There, there, there was the whole thing about uh, about creation and uh, and everything had a cause until you came to the uncaused cause, which was God. God was the uncaused cause. And I can remember saying to a, a missionary who came to our school once to rev us up a bit, and, uh, uh, and I asked him, uh, the conversation lent itself to the question, and I, I said to him something like, um, but, but is there anything wrong? in questioning the existence of God and I didn't mean that I didn't believe in God I was just trying to articulate surely there's nothing wrong with asking mm. and his reply was that the greatest sin in the eyes of God is the sin of intellectual arrogance and I thought well that's you know in my own way I thought well that's that's not an enormously reassuring answer yeah. <laughs> understatement you know you raise education I was quite intrigued your academic record I think you say was muddling at best with a few flashes of achievement but it was it was actually the opposite of my brother Tony really. <laughs> but, but class sizes there was something like 116 in one class teachers were as young as 22 yeah. and we keep bagging and, our... and with limited actual education training yeah so, uh, so no we... wonder they were resorting to the strap well, and when we say our education system hasn't matured in many ways, I mean... It has in that regard. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, the... I mean, I, I did the Julia Zamiro program, which is where this stuff came out. I hadn't really reflected much on my, on my time at the Christian Brothers, but for nine years, I won't say I was beaten from pillar to post, but, but there was barely a week in the nine years where I didn't get the strap at least once. Uh, and, and there were some fairly unpleasant exchanges with some brothers, not, not most of them, but with some, one in particular. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was fascinating to me, after I did the Zamiro program, my old principal, and he is old, uh, older, he's 90-something, uh, Bernie Crawford. We all used to call him Bernie, not to his face. But um, Bernie, Bernie was, was quite restrained in his use of the strap, uh, and we all liked him instinctively liked him and and he rang after the Zamiro program and at a certain point in the conversation and I don't think he'd mind me saying this he actually broke down into tears and told me how distressed he was at the thought that I had carried the load that he felt I had for 50 mm. years uh, and uh, and we had a long I went and saw him put a tape across the conversation and over a sandwich we had a very long conversation uh, about about his view of what went on within. Do you know, he t very quickly, Madonna, he told one story about a brother who was so distressed at having to go and face the day each day that, uh, that he, would have to be, he would have to be essentially counselled and his tears dried and he'd be, go and, go and splash water on your face and dry your tears and off you go. Yeah. How miserable. Yeah. Oh, what a miserable existence for these poor buggers who, who at 14 and 15 had convinced themselves that they had a vocation and then find themselves in front of these huge classes with not a lot of formal uh, teacher training um, and not even, you know, no one's going to say that most of them enjoyed wielding the strap. It was the only way they knew to, dis to discipline. Yeah, and, and you go into that in the book and it's really quite poignant, but you, you, you then, well, I won't say graduate because you're actually expelled before you graduate, but we'll leave that but for you. But then I was the allowed board. home for private she, study. Yes. My father walked his lonely path up the hill from the martyr where he worked up to St Lawrence's and, uh, and would parlayed it. I mean, Bernie Crawford always maintained I was never actually expelled, but that's certainly what his uh, deputy told me. <laughs> so, but in any case, moving on, because we're only up to the age of 14 or 15. Yes. I, once, I once did an interview with David Bowie, and of course he was, he'd only agreed to the interview because he wanted to publicise his concert. And after about 12 or 13 minutes, he said, Kerry, in, in the 12 minutes so far, we've covered the 70s and the 80s. When do you think we're going to get... <laughs> to 2003. Well, can I channel David Bowie now? Please. So y you didn't get a job at the Courier Mail or at the ABC and you end up in the public service. What was your job there? My first job was pushing a trolley, a filing trolley around filing um, um, 
filing files. <laughs> but they were, they were court records. Uh, it, was the, it was the public curator's office. And uh, from there I went to the Commonwealth Public Service uh, where I moved up in the world and got, the, got a job um, as a furniture removals officer. Yeah. And see, I thought, and as a parent, I found this really interesting in the book because uh, Kerry applied for so many jobs throughout his life that he actually missed out on. Um, and often acknowledging that the person who got the position would have been better for it than he was. But the journey left the public service. It went to Channel 9, Queensland Times, Newcastle, Sydney, AAP, Port Moresby, The Sun, to this day tonight. And let's just stop there for a moment because you're back in Brisbane. Joe Bajolke peterson was in his early years as Premier. I think he'd been in the job yeah. for about four years. Yep. And you say at one point that he was such a benign presence at a superficial level that you had to remind yourself of what was actually behind the mask. Mm. I think that's a fair enough comment, don't you? I do, but I want you to explain that at that time. Well, uh, as, one of his, um, as one of his own backbenchers said to him uh, in the party room, uh, as Matt Condon recounted in his book, his excellent trilogy, um, as this guy uh, said to him, you're a corrupt old bastard, Joe. It's time you went. We're not going to tolerate it anymore. That was at the end. Mm. And he was in the process of becoming that corrupt old bastard uh, in the time that I was here. Yeah. And there was a, a, a police commissioner named Ray Whitrod who was a thoroughly decent uh, and extremely well-educated um, policeman uh, who had had all kinds of experience outside of Queensland, was brought in as a clean skin to try and clean up the force. And um, Joe did wonderful things to him, like uh, Ray Whitrod um, put up three nominations for one of his deputy commissioner spots at one point and uh, put it up to the minister, and the, this, this was the tradition, apparently. Uh, but he said which one of those three he, was his first choice, and traditionally that would be the person who would be promoted by Cabinet. Except it came back this time that Joe wanted um, uh, Terry Lewis, who was an inspector. And, uh, and Ray Whitrod says, go back, uh, I go back to, uh, to Cabinet and, and give me permission to speak to Cabinet about this yeah. because, because all of my efforts to clean up the force will go out the window if this appointment is made. Uh, it, it will make a, a laughing stock of our attempts to clean up the corruption because he is widely known yeah. for what he is. And uh, back came the thing, no, you're not getting permission to speak to the thing, and whether you like it or not, you're going to have to cop this guy as one of your deputy commissioners. And we know where that ended. We know where that ended. And, you know, so as you go through your life, there's been big stories that I remember where I was moments. And, and three of them you nominate was JFK's assassination, Gough Whitlam's sacking, John Lennon being shot. But I wonder... That, that was at an emotional level, you know. That wasn't really... A, I mean, when, when JFK was shot, I was not a journalist. I was, yeah. still, I was still a humble public servant as opposed to a humble journalist. But, uh, but so, yeah, I, I remember those moments at an emotional level. So I'm wondering, though, what's the story that you remember in your old age? What's the story that really... Oh, there are a lot. ..at an emotional level? The, well, at an emotional level. Um, the, the, the documentary that I did on chemical hazards that won the gold Walkley, which was my first Walkley, it was actually the first Walkley I'd ever applied for. It hadn't even occurred to me to apply, and my dear mate and everybody's... Dear broadcaster Andrew Ollie rang me out of the blue one day and said, Kerry, I've got a message from, you know, one of the kind of elders of journalism. That he's hoping that you're going to apply with this thing. Anyway, it was, it, was about, it was about the impact of chemical hazards on people's lives in Australia in a seriously under-regulated industry where uh, the chemical almost always got the benefit of the doubt over the humans who were going to be exposed to it and some terrible stories, terrible, terrible stories. And, uh, and I will never forget those people. I'll never forget them. And so that's one. Um, standing on a man-made hillside um, on the northern tip of Mindanao in the Philippines uh, after a tsunami had torn in up the Gulf and wiped out 8,000 people, mostly Muslim fishermen and their families who were living over the water. And standing on that hill, uh, watching um, a little family weaving its way up the hill, uh, mum, dad and a couple of kids, and a tiny, a tiny coffin on a sort of wicker, you know, not wicker, in the wire basket, uh, 
uh, and they were coming up the hill to join the hundreds of other people putting um, little pathetic little crosses into this man-made hillside, which was a mass grave, and, and, and asking, because I'd gone there for four corners, and, uh, and I met two priests uh, who were there, working there as missionaries. And, uh, and I tell you what, if you're, ever, if you're ever in a strange land on a story uh, and, there's a, and there's a priest anywhere in the vicinity, go to them because they always knew what was going on, particularly so in third world countries. foreign correspondents, remember? Yeah, so so uh, I was absolutely curious to ask them how this affected them. Yeah. And, uh, and I went back and read this for the book and I was fascinated by their answers because neither of them gave a convincing answer. Uh, but they both tried to give honest answers and they both kind of, the words petered out a little, you know. So there are many other stories, but um, there are two that come to mind and in this moment. Okay, so a, a lot of your, your career has been around politics, so let's come to that. Uh, and Prime Ministers, because we've had so many of them recently. Mm. But who's, the, who's been the best or the most effective Prime Minister in your view? Well, um, you can, you can apply a couple of measures to this. One is longevity, and the other is doing things. <laughs> and uh, and, I, and I, grew up, I grew up hearing that Bob Menzies was Australia's greatest prime minister. But then as I got more interested in politics and I kind of tapped into that, what people were really saying was that he was a brilliant politician uh, who had managed to uh, remained Prime Minister second time around for 16 and a half years, I think it was, and laid the foundation for 23 years of conservative rule at the national level. And you have to say was, was partly responsible because of his, his political instincts and skills and prowess that he had contributed to the mess that Labor yeah. largely put itself in for a long time and kept itself out of power. Um, so, you know, if, if you're applying that level, that, uh, that measure, then John Howard was a very successful politician because he was the second longest serving politician in Australian history. He ruled for 11 and a half years. But, um, but forgetting, you know, I can only talk about in my time really because uh, how you, how you um, measure a wartime leader like Curtin alongside a, a Hawke or a Keating or a Howard or any of those others, very hard to do. Um, not quite like measuring Farlap and Winks, but, <laughs> but, uh, but different eras, different circumstances. Uh, I, think, I think that even conservatives, thinking conservatives, would acknowledge that the Hawke-Keating years in particular, uh, so while Hawke was Prime Minister, yeah. those eight years, eight and a half years that Hawke was Prime Minister, but with, with uh, the extraordinarily talented Paul Keating at his elbow as Treasurer, leading that reform process with Hawke managing the cabinet and running a consensus cabinet. Um, th those reforms, whether you agree with the reforms or not, the bottom line is it is, I think, the, the most successful, the, the era uh, where more reforms were pushed through, many of them unpopular, or some of them at least unpopular, they were shaking the cage, you know, they were making huge changes. In many instances, they were costing people their livelihoods. Traditional jobs were disappearing because of tariff cuts, uh, as a for instance. But anybody looking back now would have to acknowledge that, that, um, that Australian industry had to be dragged into the modern era. Um, so, and and to, to move towards, without abandoning manufacturing, to move towards a service economy and to, to acknowledge the coming of the digital age that is now on us. Um, so those eight years, and Paul Keating, of course, would argue the continuation of them under his prime ministership, <laughs> but those eight years particularly were, uh, were, were a period of enormous reform success, marrying the politics with the policy. So many people almost get there. Who might have been the best prime minister we never had? Uh, well, um, uh, Alan Ramsey once wrote, and I had a lot of time for Alan, and his political judgment. He was around Canberra for a long time. Alan Ramsey once wrote that John Button was the best Prime Minister Australia never had. Uh, Peter Bowers, another great columnist for the Sydney Morning Herald, once wrote that John Button, his colleagues regarded, they liked him, 
but he used to annoy them because he would, he would uh, surprise them with some of his moments of candour. Of course, the journalists loved him for the same thing. <laughs> we all loved his candour. But, uh, but Peter Bowers wrote that, uh, jo that um, John Button was the only man he knew who could dance his way through a rain, uh, through a, uh, rain shower without getting wet. <laughs> um, Gough Whitlam had said uh, that John Faulkner was the greatest prime, prime minister Australia never had. I didn't buy that because although I think John Faulkner was a fundamentally decent human being who has tried to keep his own party honest and has tried to lead it through a mm. necessary reform process, uh, I think that Faulkner would have been too diffident uh, to, be, to have been a successful Prime Minister and he would have hated it, which is probably why he never tried to put his hat in the ring. Kim Beasley? Well, you know what I've said about Kim Beasley. But I, our audience I, don't. Uh, read the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Goff used to say, you know, you, you're interviewing him. I interviewed him once about, about his book and almost every question I asked him about anything, read, read the, the book. book. <laughs> okay, so, no, you can read the book on that. Let oh, me no, no, I'll tell you about it. Very quickly, Kim Beasley, thoroughly decent human being, very bright man, probably should have been a professor at a university. And that doesn't denigrate universities for one second. I just think he was a fish out... It doesn't. It doesn't. All right. Very important. I think he was a fish out of water. And, and I think Howard pinged him when he started asking about his ticker in 2001. So you, you mentioned Gough Whitlam. You went to work for Gough Whitlam as a press secretary when you were quite young, 32, I think. And you've, so you've seen our leaders from both sides of the camera. Yeah. The level of sophistication in how governments now manage their message in the media has grown exponentially. You know, and a couple of little ideas surfaced through your book. You know, Kevin Rudd asking the question and answering his own. John Howard, a very, very clever way of running sentences together. How has that message changed and how well is the media being managed by our politicians? Well, um, Scott Morrison, not too well. <laughs> Certainly not when he misses the bus. <laughs> but but, um, but um, uh, uh, the scope is there for the media to be manipulated and, and I think the media is allowing that manipulation to a degree. And I don't, I mean the individual journalists, the poor buggers are so bloody run off their feet often uh, I think uh, news, newsrooms are run down. Um, a lot of the experience has been shown the door because uh, when redundancies come round these days, not always, but often, it's the older journalists who are targeted because they're the expensive ones, as they should be, because they're the ones um, who have built up the knowledge, the expertise, and have got the scars to show for it. And they, and they have the memory of the history um, and, and used to conduct to a much greater degree, um, a, a, a vital mentoring role for the young journalists coming on. But um, I think that, that really um, there was this kind of explosion of media minders and other expert staff that really began in the Whitlam years and has just grown and grown and grown. Uh, that was also true of lobbyists. There were only two lobby groups that I can think of in Canberra um, in the pre-Whitlam era. Um, and, uh, and, and so there's been this massive explosion and I can remember, I mean, Gough had so many policies on the go at one time with a whole bunch of inexperienced ministers trying to do 10 years worth of reform in three, uh, at three years that involved two terms in office, you know, two elections. Yeah. But uh, there was one occasion when he, he absolutely laid down the law. He said there was so much leaking going on because because there were all these press secretaries who couldn't believe, you know, that half of them had been recruited from the gallery and couldn't believe their luck, nor could they contain themselves <laughs> after the third beer, in some instances, down in the non-members bar. So there were all these leaks going out, and, and many of them were coming from ministers who were trying to get the jump on other ministers to get their policy up over that one. And so Goff says to his cabinet, the next, you know, and, and, and of course they were all saying, well, it's actually the staff, not the ministers. So he says the next, the next staffer who is caught leaking is gone, they're out the door. And, uh, and before that cabinet meeting had broken up, the word was around the gallery. <laughs> it had been leaked while cabinet was still going. <laughs> so, uh, but, but, but the, the kind of, the, 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 the canniness, I suppose, uh, the wiliness um, of, of getting one up over the other side through your manipulation of your media, the, the obsession about settling on a message for the day and then getting yeah. that message out. So if you're invited onto, the, onto 
for instance, um, regardless of what questions are asked, your primary motive in being there is to get that message of the day out. And uh, with, there was a Howard interview that I gave as an example, truly, it's, it, it's very funny in the end, the number of times, even in one sentence, that he repeats the message. Yeah. Um, and, and that's just one kind of illustration. So, um, and that's in the book where it goes, you, you know, what, what Kerry said and what he said. And he just, whatever your question is, it's the same response. Yeah. Um, what keeps you, what worries you about our contemporary leadership and where Australia's going? Is there something just given your history and experience yeah. that... What contemporary leadership is that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's too easy to kind of denigrate it, but uh, it's just bloody sad, you know. It is sad and it is worrying. And, uh, and both, both major parties need to take a long, hard look at themselves and, and I think they've got to... There have been various attempts on the Labor side to reform within and there have been some successes and then, you know, Simon Crean tried and he fell over, you know, he didn't even make it to an election. He was the leader of the Labor Party after, uh, after Beasley. He didn't get as far as an election before he was knocked off and he was trying to reform the, 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 a, more, uh, a more democratic representation inside Labor, which even he, as a former president of the ACTU, believed unions had too strong a voice. And, and so I, I think there's a kind of atrophying, atrophying process going, uh, uh, going on with both parties. I was on the drum today and, and said again that I, I think the Liberal Party has completely lost its way. Uh, they have moved so far to the right, or they've allowed this element on the far right to dictate their mainstream way too much. Yeah. They've distorted their policy process. Uh, the end result, and you know, having uh, of the last four, of the last five prime ministers to leave office, only one was shown the door by the electorate. The other four were disposed of by their own parties. Is there any sense that the lesson's been learned on that? Or no. Yeah. And you look at today, look at the last couple of days, the response from the Liberals to being smashed in Victoria and trying to deny that there's yeah. any federal element to that. Well, that's just rubbish. That just, that just uh, insults people's intelligence. And, you know, so on the one hand, the, 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 the public has this sense of being terribly let down, uh, of becoming completely cynical about politicians who they believe are ruled by cynicism, uh, but, then to, to, but then to have their intelligence insulted at the same time, they're just... They're just rubbing salt into the wounds. Yeah. History can be kinder, to, or the rear vision mirror in one sense. You look at Julia Gillard now, and I wonder if history is painting her in a much nicer way than, than contemporary commentary did. Do you think that's deserved? Well, I'd say read the chapter on Kevin and Julia. <laughs> um, uh, somebody, somebody asked me, well, I think I actually said it in the book, that, that she certainly deserves... Um, uh, you know, she has her place in history for one piece of policy more than practically any other, and that was uh, the disability scheme. NDIS. Um, and then somebody else said to me, well, shouldn't you have mentioned uh, the Royal Commission into Sexual Abuse? And I th thought about it and I said no, because, I mean, uh, that was a terrific initiative, a terrific and long overdue initiative, but, um, but it, it wasn't a difficult decision for her to come to. She wasn't putting her government at risk by, by announcing it and, uh, and fantastic that she did it but that to me was not a great example of great leadership whereas the NDIS was. It was a huge spending priority. She had uh, an opposition that was, um, that, that, you know, um, endeavoured to belt Labor every time they added another billion to the bottom line um, and it was a tough one to get through. Uh, and she did it. Uh, I think it ended up as a bipartisan initiative. It's not necessarily how it was going to start, but 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 I, I think her legacy is is going to be forever tarnished by the fact that she allowed herself to be influenced by some pretty mediocre, self-interested individuals that uh, that she needed to step up and be a part of the process of throwing Kevin out. And I don't think Kevin Rudd deserved to be thrown out at that point, but even if he did, I think it was an act of political stupidity. Do you think history will see Kevin Rudd in a kinder way down the track? Well, he's not helping himself. <laughs> um, not, not, uh, look, uh, uh, to be fair to him, I haven't read the whole of volume two. I've got it on my 
I've, I've got a... Oh. Hands up if you have. Um, <clears throat> I've read some, and, and I, th I think he actually writes well. And I did read the first one because I interviewed him for it at the Wheeler Centre in Melbourne when it was launched. Uh, and, and I think there are some valuable parts in that book. Um, and as I'm sure there are in the second. Uh, he's got a terrific um, uh, treatment on Iraq and how Australia got into Iraq and the awfulness of that war and the... Don't get me started. But, but, um, but he, A, he, he took his time about writing it uh, and, and, and the party has moved on. Yeah. But then in volume two, he's sort of back into yeah. the, old, the old fights and he says in his defence, well, it's only a very small part of the book. It may yeah. be, but he knew before he wrote it, it was the, it was the part that was going to be mostly reported. Yes. And so it just makes him sound like a, a bitter guy who can't get over it. So um, just while we're on legacies, because I do want to move on to other things, but Donald Trump. That's not a legacy. <laughs> what That's, is it? That it it's, an obs it's an obscenity. It's an obscenity. <laughs> Um, I mean, his presidency is an obscenity, and uh, and I, uh, you know, I've thought about this a lot, whether whether I would prefer to see him impeached and leave that way, or massively voted out by the American people at the next election, and if it means putting up with him for another two years, and hope that a democratic major Democrat majority in the lower house will stop his worst aberrations and his most dangerous possibilities. Um, I think it's probably important for that country to wait and demonstrate to themselves and to the rest of us that they value democracy far too much uh, to, even, to even allow him a, um, 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 you know, a kind of average defeat. Yeah. It needs to be a very loud cry from the American people because, uh, because this is a dangerous moment and he is a part of a global landscape as far as the democratic world is concerned, which is... Which is um, there's a wonderful Irish columnist named Fintan O'Toole, F-I-N-T-A-N O'Toole, who writes for the Irish Times, amongst others. He's written two great columns this year on what he calls this pre-fascist age, and he's referring um, substantially to Trump, Trumpism, but also these kind of illiberal democracies that are now popping up in middle Europe, like, like Hungary, like Poland, uh, most recently Sweden, the mess that Britain's in over Brexit and the kind of the, the stuff that's going on behind that. Uh, an Italian interior minister who I think it might even be deputy leader, senior politician, interior minister who, who publicly regrets that he can't round up the, all the gypsies in Italy and throw them out of the country because some of them are actually citizens and he can't. You know, and this said against the landscape of 500,000 gypsies Romans yeah. who were wiped out in the Hitler era, you know, their own genocide. That's, that is a worrying trend and you throw Trump in on top of that, you, this, this sort of revivalism of the worst of the, of the Soviet era, you know, we might, uh, we might think that, that North Korea is our problem on nuclear weapons. Um, I, think, I think there are far more things to worry about with nuclear weapons than the madness of North Korea, I don't dismiss it. But, um, you know, there are lots of, lots of shifting sands in the world today. All, all in this digital age, it's an age of, of confusion, it's an age of anxiety, uh, it's an age of uncertainty. But, um, uh, at, but at a time when we need inspired, good inspired leadership, knowledgeable, wise leadership, we seem to be getting the opposite just about everywhere. Okay, I want to come to your questions there in a little while too, and there's two microphones on either side of the hall, but let me bring it back to the personal again, Kerry. You don't travel like you did and have the jobs you did without some kind of cost to the family, and you, you have been married twice. I think you've got yeah. six children, yeah. uh, some of whom were dragged across one side of the world for a year and back again. Oh, but again. they loved that. I bet they did. <laughs> but there's a story in it where I caught my breath catching, you caught your little girl whose dressing gown was on fire. That was, um, I mean, that could have been any, any family yeah. anywhere in Australia. I mean, that was a, that was a <laughs> Sat Saturday morning in almost any household. My wife, Carol, my then wife, Carol, uh, had managed to get an early 
appointment with the hairdresser because we were going to do something with the day. And I was in bed reading the papers and Lara, who was five, nearly six, was suddenly screaming in the lounge room and I raced out and she had a, a dressing gown that, that you could only take off over her head because it was a sort of half zip. Uh, and it was a chenille dressing gown and she had her back to the flames of a gas heater and we'd had no experience of gas heaters and this one had a metal guard but it obviously wasn't a particularly good one. And so the bottom of her dressing gown had caught fire and I had to, the only way I could get that off that I could see and that was my first instinct was to pull it off over her head and I'm so conscious of the flames as I pulled it off. Her face was untouched and then had her under the shower and then had to try and ring the ambulance. Um, and sitting in that ambulance going to the hospital was, uh, was, is so deeply embedded into my memory that I still occasionally, when I hear the siren, I see the ambulance go past, I put myself in the back of the ambulance again yeah. and wonder what pain yeah. and yeah. awfulness there is there. I think the cleverness of your book too is weaving the personal and it could be in any family some of the things that happened and I'm thinking of your brother Paul and you lost him to suicide. Yeah, he was 40 and uh, Paul was a lovely kid, he was my kid brother, he was born on my seventh birthday, we shared a bedroom for many years and, uh, and Paul um, was a great sportsman played with his first 15, played rugby first 15 for St Lawrence's, um, was an athlete, he competed at, at state level at athletics. Um, he was bright, you know, he was, he was quite, scholastic, quite scholastic at school, um, went to university, but there was a kind of a vagueness in Paul and, uh, and um, he became a bit of a vagabond. He hated me saying that to him once and I, to me a vagabond was kind of romantic and he thought it was, a, but it, well, I was putting him down. But, but um, he travelled the world and he would work around the world to pay for his travelling and it was only in his late 30s that he was diagnosed as schizophrenic and, uh, and then poor bugger was hit with a very rare disease called aplastic anemia which was a blood disorder and the only, the only permanent that the only treatment for it that would have any long-term success was a bone marrow transplant and Barbara and our brother Tony and I all um, were tested for it and none of us were compatible, uh, which made his chances of finding a compatible donor elsewhere in the world almost impossible. And um, so it had got to a point and he began to get paranoid um, and... Um, here in Brisbane he was, he was staying at that stage, he was staying at the CWA just up on Spring Hill because he was having his platelets replaced or um, added to, I can't remember the precise medical details now, down at Brisbane Hospital. And on this Saturday morning uh, my wife Sue and I and our kids were just leaving the Gold Coast where mum and dad were still living and Paul rang from Brisbane and said he was saying goodbye. And, uh, and although ostensibly he was just saying goodbye at the end of that part of our holiday. I just had a, a sense that something wasn't quite right and I said as much to Sue but by the time we got up to, um, to uh, the Sunshine Coast where we were staying for a week, a message came from Barbara that he'd walked off the roof of this four-storey building and was um, brain damaged, uh, essentially brain dead, lying with his heart still beating at Brisbane Hospital and so you know, I, I'll never forget a lot of um, just so sad, you know, mm. as any mother would be, if you as could just imagine it. And, and of course, how does a mother ever recover from that? You don't. You don't. You raise mental illness again when talking to Robin Williams. Yes. In what I saw was a, quite a fascinating interview. Well, he talked about his depression. And, and what I certainly didn't know and what I suspect he didn't know at that time was was that he was already in the early stages of that debilitating form of, um, it was a combination of things really, but, uh, but part of it was a, was a rapid an advance of dementia. And, uh, and, and his wife wrote the most powerful um, and, uh, and erudite and moving description of, of his decline while still trying to function as a performer. Mm. In a, a stage play 
where she said he, had, he never forgot a line, you know, he was so proud of his memory and his capacity to deliver his lines and he could not remember the simplest things, but he was still trying to muddle through. Um, so by the time uh, Robin Williams took his life, when you read this background, you certainly understood this was not just a surrender to, to an at times crippling depression, which can be moving enough and hard enough, but, but it, was, it, was the, it was the state of collapse of his entire system. You know, and I part raised him because while we know you predominantly through politics, there's a lot of other people you've interviewed, you know, the likes of Billy Crystal, James Taylor, Carol King, Luciano Pavarotti, Bruce Springsteen. Oh, with Pavarotti, he almost introduced him, in, interviewed himself. <laughs> he, did, he did everything else. Well, I was going to say pick one of them. <laughs> so t tell us about I'll Pavarotti. I'll give you a quick Pavarotti and then I'll try and tell you a quick something else. But Pavarotti um, was on his last. He was, he was his, it was his farewell tour around the world and I got the interview with him. But there were so many instructions that preceded his arrival, one of which was the interview, he had to sit behind a desk. The camera had to be framed to his instructions. He couldn't be, he couldn't be filmed below waist level. Um, and so it went on. And, uh, and then when he arrived, he was running a bit late, and, and so I was standing at the door to the hotel suite that we were set up in, and he, he was wheeled out of the lift in a wheelchair, and then the wheelchair was aban abandoned. He was assisted by two aides, and he walked, you know, like as if you nonchalantly just hanging his arms over a couple of mates while he walks into the room, but basically they had become, they'd replaced his wheelchair because he could barely walk. Uh, but, and, and that's... You know, that was a reality for him. But he was so self-conscious about it. He was so self-conscious about his presence. Uh, he clearly wanted, you know, he had very ample girth, as we all know. He clearly wanted to hide that as much as possible. Uh, and then his face was so painted. He, he, his face was as painted as it w would be for any opera. Um, he had these two great smears across his face, which were his deep black eyebrows. His hair was so obviously dyed. Uh, but I had, I had just said to my cameraman, look, um, he can't dictate to us how you frame. Vince Tucci was the cameraman. He was a veteran cameraman in Melbourne, terrific guy. And, uh, and Vince agreed with me that he would insist that he had to frame the shot. So Pavarotti comes in and Pavarotti looks at the... He had a monitor. He even had his own monitor to check his shot. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so we had very sternly spoken to his miners before he got there and said, look... The, the, no cameraman abandons his camera. Something could happen to the shot. Uh, he, he must stay with his camera. And they sort of looked knowingly at me, but they said, you know, we will see. So, so I say to Vince, whatever happens, Vince, don't leave your post. And so we settle on the framing. I didn't mind that. That didn't matter. And, and I do the interview. Uh, you know, he settles under, behind the table, hides his gut. We do the interview, and at the end of the interview, I turn to Vince for a bit of reassurance that everything had got the thumbs up. And there in the far corner of the room sat Vince, and there behind me was the unmanned camera. <laughs> he, said, he said, Kerry, I tried, but, but, but just as the interview started, I felt this very strong hand on my left elbow leading me, <laughs> leading me away. That was Pavarotti. <coughs> and let me tell you, the stories relating to the others are just as interesting.